But first, former President Donald Trump has been indicted in his fourth criminal case in five months. This most recent charge alleges he and 18 allies worked together to overturn his 2020 election loss in the state of Georgia. The 2024 presidential candidate has been charged, along with several others, under the state's racketeering law. Nick Allard, dean of the College of Law at Jacksonville University, is here now to explain what this all means, break it down for us, and see what this means for both Trump and the nation, given his 2024 presidential aspirations. Thank you, Nick, so much for being here. This is a huge story. We're saying before the break, there's a lot of pieces, and we're excited to have you here. Thanks for having me. And during this first week of our second year of the law school, what a less, what a you know, real life lesson. And we think we we feel like we won the lottery with our twenty six megapix, the new students. What a time for them to be going to law so school. So lucky for them. Yeah. And you, my friends, can also join the conversation. Call us at five four nine two nine three seven. Tweet us at FCC on air. Email us at First Coast Connect at WJCT.org or message us on the First Coast Connect Facebook page. Now, let's start with uh, I guess the, the the very top of the story. What exactly was Trump charged with in Georgia? Trump charged with uh, Trump was charged with eleven counts, uh, and that makes a total in the four cases that he's been indicted on of ninety-one counts of criminal felonies. Uh, so in this case, in state court, he's charged with basically a series of actions to defraud the people of the correct vote and the results of the twenty twenty election. And that involves a lot of different actions. But he's charged also, uh, and these charges are related to the state, the Georgia State RICO Act. That's the Racketeering Influenced Criminal Organization Act, which gives the state broad powers. The federal statute, the federal right RICO statute, is extremely broad. It gives broad powers and advantages to the uh, prosecutor. The Georgia statute is even broader. And this was this law or this um, this RICO Act was originally created to help fight organized crime like mafia mob, right? Well, it was originally brought, and ironically, one of the people who's used it to, to extensively and very aggressively was one of the defendants under the RICO charges, Rudy Giuliani, and used mm. it in New York. Mm-hmm. Now, the reason for this RICO statute was to get at organized crime, organized criminal enterprises like the mafia, where the head of the mafia, the Don Corleones, could insulate themselves from criminal exposure and, you know, throw their underlings under the bus and never be tied to the actual crime. So these RICO prosecutions have expanded both at the federal level and the state level far beyond just mafiosa, uh, La Costa Nostra type of activities. And the whole idea is that... um, in addition to requiring an ongoing criminal enterprise, if you're able to find it, you don't necessarily have to directly connect the head of the enterprise to find evidence of direct involvement in the crime. If it's a criminal enterprise and you prove that the head of the enterprise and you make the other elements of the case, then you, they can be convicted under RICO. And there's broad powers. And I feel like that's gonna, we're, we're definitely seeing how broad that is because of how many charges there are and how many people are involved. But how is this latest? Uh, how is the latest Georgia prosecution of Trump different from the other three indictments that have been brought against him? You know, you're hearing people say that it duplicates the federal special prosecutor Jack Smith's case. So, could you kind of explain what's what's similar there? You know, that's a great question. And Al better be careful. He might be like Wally Pipps. You know, when Lou Gehrig stepped in for him for one day, and then you know what happened after that. So. You know, you're doing great, but that's a wonderful I question. I don't understand all sports, but I know that's a compliment. You know, so thank that you. is a compliment. <laughs> Trust me. You know, a record-breaking uh, service uh, to the New York Yankees. Anyway, um, you hear a lot of people say that the Florida case is duplicative of the federal case, and it isn't. I mean, it isn't for many, many reasons. Uh, it's brought under the state law, which is broader. It's far more sweeping. Jack Smith's, uh, special prosecutor Jack Smith's federal case is focused on Donald Trump. This has 19 defendants, and they're all going to be tried together, and it's going to be on television uh, if it remains in the, in, in the state. So there are many, many significant differences. One of them also is if there's a conviction, uh, there is considerably less, maybe no latitude for uh, Mr. Trump 
if he's convicted, and it's if he deserves the presumption of innocence, which he will get. He deserves uh, to have his day in court and, and to defend himself or not say anything at all under a constitutional rights. But if he's convicted, um, the opportunities for him maybe if he gets elected, these are all very many big ifs, to uh, pardon himself or to escape uh, the mandatory uh, uh, criminal sentences that are required under conviction are far less under a state, state but, prosecution. And what about these 18 associates who have been charged along with them? I mean, are they all looking at the same outcomes here? And how did, how were, how were the prosecutors able to find all of them and charge all 18? They've been working at this meticulously, sadly, professionally for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an initial grand jury, then the grand jury was uh, created a special grand jury to expand the authority. Uh, there's been subpoenas, so there's a massive amount of evidence that will be brought into play, including the tape, the famous recording. It's not a tape anymore, I guess, but it's right. a recording. I'm dating myself. <laughs> The documents, a lot of documents, and, you know, the documents uh, tell the tale. Uh, they can't be impeached. They're, they're evidence. They're solid evidence. And then uh, some of these 19 uh, may flip. They may uh, cut a deal and, and uh, te begin to be test testifying. And in addition, uh, you know, they'll all be tried together. So if it appears on television, and it looks like it will unless it's removed, uh, we've already seen some of the initial sites on television. You're going to see the company that Mr. Trump give, keeps. They're all going to be together. Mm -hmm. And that will be a remarkable scene. And let's talk about some of the people who are involved, because these are big names like Rudy Giuliani, a uh, Trump attorney and former New York City mayor. John Eastman, another attorney on Trump's team. Um, Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows. These are names that you would hope would never end up in this kind of this kind of case. But what is the significance of of Mark Meadows trying to remove the case to federal court? Well, there's a lot of questions in that question, so I'll, I'll try to unpack it. So first, the removal that we heard, uh, Mr. Meadows, that's a very interesting effort. Now, there is a statute that permits, under certain circumstances, when charges are brought in a state court, for um, a federal official who's acting under color of his authority as an official to remove the case to federal court. So he has sought that. Mr. Trump hasn't yet. Others haven't yet, to my knowledge. And so that will be debated, but it's not a clear-cut argument either way, in my, my personal view. Um, that is be, and the, one of the interesting things is, if under the law, uh, Mr. Meadows has to argue that he was acting under color of his position as the chief of staff of the president. So what does that mean? Does that mean that he was acting on behalf of the president or was off on, a, on his own uh, jog, because on his own? Does that make it better or worse? And as really? a defendant charged with criminal activities, his defense is likely to be, well, I was just following orders, right? So mm -hmm. it's gonna, that's a very interesting motion. Another aspect of the motion that's very interesting is that if he removes it to the federal court, and by the way, the prosecutor, uh, Fulton County District Attorney, uh, Fonny Willis will still be prosecuting the case, and that Georgia, I almost said Florida, the Georgia statute. Not this time. I know, <laughs> no. right? I'm right. The, the Georgia, it's not funny, so forgive me for, for laughing, but the, the Georgia uh, statute will still be tried, and the Georgia witnesses, which by the way are all Republicans, are not mainly Republicans. There's, you know, this is a war between. In the Georgia case, uh, the, the Republican Party, uh, because many of the defendants are former Republican, uh, you know, chairman, party leaders, mm -hmm. and others, and so on, and the people who are already outspoken uh, and have been witnesses include the lieutenant governor, uh, and today or yesterday, the sitting governor Kemp uh, had some very uh, tough comments to make about the case and about Mr. Trump. So, this is a war within the Republican Party with the witnesses, some of the victims, some of the workers, the election workers, uh, who were... Ruby Freeman was a, a, a poll worker, and she and her daughter had to go into hiding because so many of uh, President Trump's supporters were sending death threats. And one, I think a police cha chaplain from Illinois showed up to their home and allegedly threatened them. Exactly right. Full marks. Al, you better hurry back. <laughs> <laughs> 
But uh, no, exactly right. So all, uh, many, most of the characters are going to be uh, Republicans in, in this state of Georgia. And so for that reason alone, you know, the removal is kind of interesting, but it'll still be in a federal court in Georgia. And also it's very interesting that in the 11th Circuit, Mr. Trump is involved in a RICO case that's been brought against Hillary Clinton that's still pending appeal. Mm -hmm. So in one case, he's going to be advocating the power of RICO. In the other case, his attorneys will be, you know, probably saying that it's overreach and an inappropriate use of the statute to apply in a political situation. So, I mean, Mr. Trump has been known sometimes for being inconsistent, but this may be one very excruciating situation for him to have to argue both sides of the same Right. Issue. I mean, it sounds like they'll, they're will they going to use what they can to whatever advantage they can in, and no, not ending up in prison, it sounds like. No, well, if there's a conviction. If there's, right, correct. If there's a conviction, the prison terms are mandatory. There's mandatory under RICO. There's mandatory minimums. I think they're five years. You can check me on that. And the maximums for each count are 20 years. So this is very similar. This is very serious legal peril. Also, it should not be ignored that the conviction rate for this district attorney is in the 90s. 90% 90 of the time, she prevails. And this is uh, Fannie... Fannie Willis. Fannie Willis. And also, she is an equal opportunity prosecutor. She has prosecuted uh, black rap musicians. Mm -hmm. She has prosecuted other people under the RICO statutes who are involved in corporate criminal activity. And she's very, very experienced and spent a lot of time building her case. Now, she is very aggressive, and their arguments will be made, and we haven't heard, the public hasn't heard the facts, but I would urge the general public, if they can, it's readily available to read the indictment. It's in readable English. It tells a story. Then watch the trial, listen, and form your own opinion. If you will, pretend that you're a, a, a virtual juror uh, in the court of public opinion, and form your own opinion. Has the case been made or hasn't it? Now, I know Americans have strong feelings on both sides of this case and both sides of the debate that's going on, uh, certainly the, that's a great the legal practice. case, but they should form their own decision. We're in a world where the pursuit of the truth is very difficult. There's a lot of information, misinformation, and this is very complex stuff. Right. I mean, you you almost are getting... A legal education from just listening to the news but you want to make sure you have a good legal education so Absolutely. I'm urging voters and the American public to study up look at the facts watch yourself as much as you can of the proceedings and form your own opinion a great a great exercise for sure it's a it's WJCT news you're listening to First Coast Connect we're speaking with Nick Allardeen of the College Law of Jacksonville University Going over the Trump indictment in Georgia and bra really breaking it down piece by piece. You can also join the conversation. Call us at 549-2937. You can also tweet us at FCC on air or email your comments to firstcoastconnect at wjct.org. And we have, a, we have a tweet from at Jules and Jax. She was asking, what does Dean Allard make of the fact that so many of the former president's co-conspirators are attorneys? Are you concerned that the bar members are more partisan? That is a wonderful question, and here's why. It is a sad thing whenever an attorney, we recently had a very prominent case here in, uh, in the First Coast of a very prominent attorney being tried for defrauding his clients. It's a sad thing when you see that, and it happens. We live in an imperfect world. But those people, I can assure you, are the outliers. Uh, now, also, I'll note that there are the... These are allegations. They, too, those defendants are entitled to the presumption of innocence. They'll get to say their case. But it's a sad thing that they've even been engaged in activity or near enough that their scruples can be challenged. So this is why, and this is bringing me back to the, your law school here in Jacksonville, Jacksonville University College of Law. From the very first day, we emphasize the primacy of not just knowing how to practice law and being smart, which they will be, but the ethics and values and the need for lawyers to serve others in the public interest, the public good, and you have those dual responsibilities. My deanship is named after a very well-known and highly respected 
um, Jacksonville attorney, Randall Seberg Jr., who devoted his whole life to ethics. So every time I'm introduced in that way as the Randall Seberg dean, it reminds people, I hope, and connects our law school and our efforts. So this is what we're working on. But my point is, is that these lawyers are the outliers, and they remind us of what's right or wrong. And I should also note that over the last year, the Florida Bar conducted a massive survey of what is most important in practice. Now, I, when I heard that, I expected there would be, well, um, more affordable uh, legal services, higher pay, mm -hmm. better use of technology. The number one finding of judges and the outstanding Florida bench and bar was ethics and professionalism. Hmm. So this is what the outstanding bench and bar stand for in Jacksonville. And by the way, in Jacksonville, I'm told by Max Marbutt and other people that follow these things that there uh, are far fewer um, conduct cases brought against unethical um, lawyers than in any other place. So that's a very important thing. And so that's a long answer to a very good question. Um, the, it is very disturbing and upsetting that anybody is involved in this case. For us, it's very uh, hurtful, but it's a learning moment for us to see what are the ethical and professional responsibilities of lawyers, which is not only for themselves to do well, but to do good. And we have another question from Lisa from Tallahassee. Wow, thank you so much for calling us all the way here in Jacksonville. Good morning, Lisa. Please keep it on topic and keep it brief. Yes, good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I have a question because, you know, it's hard to keep all the strings of these uh, separate, but I know, Jack Smith, there's a question about uh, protection of witnesses because of, you know, uh, Trump publicly berating and threatening and encouraging, um, you know, uh, retribution and including what happened in Utah with the, the gentleman that was going to go after Alvin Bragg. In Georgia, we've already seen what he has had done with um, R Ruby. I can't remember her name. Ruby Freeman. Is there? Yes. What um, can if if I, I know he's not gotten before the judge? I don't believe. But what protection can be baked in from the front end that he he crosses the line? It's ironic we're talking about RICO charges because this is very mob behavior. What if he crosses over the line? Is there? Um, a possibility that he can be, um, what's the word? I, I'm not going to say put in jail, but I mean, he presents a very real danger for a lot of the people that would be providing information, both he and, and his implied orders to his people, just like January 6th. In all of these cases, we know what he does, you know, he threatens witnesses and witness right. intimidation. So I'd like you I mean, I, like I said, there's four cases going on, and I know it's complicated. And what's her name? Chuch, Chuch, Chuchin has put him on notice. So I'd like to hear what you have to say about witness protection, witness intimidation, and that kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. That is an exquisite question about the integrity and maintaining um, the justice system, and in particularly the people, the, the everyday people who are doing their part to testify, to run the courts, and uh, it, it just goes to the heart of our justice system. And if I may make a personal comment, uh, you know, I believe that Mr. Trump is lighting matches in a dynamite shed right now, and it is very, very dangerous. Now, um, so forgive me for that personal comment and observation. So, for example, he is planning a, he said that he's planning next week a press conference where he's going to give a report on why the uh, election system, uh, why the 220 election was stolen, and why there was election massive election fraud. And so we'll see. I mean, the governor of Georgia has said, you know, he's that's just not possible. There was no election fraud, and there's no proof of that. And in fact, the Trump uh, organization brought over 50 cases, and none of them prevailed. They lost in 50 cases trying to show evidence of election fraud across the country. But to your question, uh, he has been making uh, inflammatory statements and naming people and 
releasing on, on social media the picture of the judge and things. He's just, frankly, I'm sure his lawyers are very uncomfortable both about the press conference that he's planned and the comments that he's making. I, there are some folks who have told me that they believe that what he is doing, first of all, it, it's kind of childish, if you forgive me for characterizing it. I shouldn't be doing that. I should be just unpacking this and so hard. It's difficult. Me. It's difficult not to. Forgive I mean, this me. whole And it's unbecoming. Is it's unbecoming. Uh, I, when some of the characters that are involved in this case was on the television, my three-year-old grandson looked up over his shoulder and said, what a crybaby. <laughs> and so out of the mouths of babes, you know. And I mean, it's not like... Uh, t- Take your medicine and eat your vegetables. It's constantly blaming other people, but also putting people at risk. And it's very, very serious. Right. And it should not be happening. So maybe, you know, what is he doing? I mean, he's very shrewd. He may be trying to provoke the judge to react. Uh, he may be going as close to the line as he can. He may be trying to provoke the judge to react and to issue an order, which then he can challenge and try to delay things. But it is very dangerous uh, to to put at risk, given the world that we, we live in. And I think that almost all Americans are decent, good people who, even though we disagree, we agree to disagree peacefully. Uh, so people but there are, are those about this. Uh, people are very riled up. And, and, you know, this harkens back to other huge moments in our history where we've come apart and had difficult times and violence. I mean, this is this puts our democracy on the edge, uh, like the time leading up to the Civil War, and you know, like the time back in the early days of the Republic when Aaron Burr uh, plotted to set up a separate country, uh, treasonously mm-hmm. did that. And so, we're this is a there's a lot at stake right here on how this turns out either way. And yet, and what would you say is at stake? What does this controversy stack up in in U.S. history? Well, first of all, the most recent memory is the Watergate. So it's certainly mm-hmm. worth comparing that. And you have the cast of characters now, Mark Meadows, Rudy Giuliani, uh, so many others uh, who are going to become even more household names than they have been. Uh, and you know, I hearken back, I remember when I was growing up and watching uh, the Watergate hearings and you know, had those, uh, H.R. Hall, I mean, Halderman, Ehrlichman, Rosemary Woods, who had the famous 18-minute tape, she was the president's secretary. They had mm-hmm. they had recordings then that were critical and documents Still then. Still things done today. Yeah, and that'll happen again. But I think that this case by far overshadows Watergate. It it engulfs. It's like a su- tsunami compared to the Watergate flood of impropriety, right. and for so many reasons. And this puts the very core. I like Watergate, but it's a much broader effort than a burglary of the Watergate 